Thank you for joining us uh, on Middle East Eye. Uh, it's our pleasure today uh, to be speaking with the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. Prime Minister, have we reached uh, an inflection point in world history with the departure of the US from Central Asia? Will the region now pivot towards China as the investor and de facto security umbrella? David, it's too early to say, you know, right now, I mean, events in Afghanistan are still evolving. No one, people like us, don't know where it's going to go. <clears throat> but uh, the U.S. presence no longer there. There's obviously going to be a vacuum. Who's going to fill it? China is obviously the emerging power. But... Uh, the way we look at it is that, uh, and having spoken to all the regional countries surrounding Afghanistan, everyone thinks that this is a great opportunity because Afghanistan is the trade corridor between all our countries, you know, I mean, Central Asian countries connected to Pakistan and the Indian Ocean through Afghanistan, Iran, access to Central Asia. So it's a, it's a very important country in that way. And I, what we would really like is that it's no longer uh, either you're in U.S. camp or China camp. I feel that it should be what this whole region needs, economic ties, uh, economic connectivity. That's what we are looking for. Which brings <clears throat> us on very quickly to the issue of sanctions, which are being talked about. Um, perhaps you could talk, what, what is your view on that? And give us a sense as the neighboring the neighbouring country knows more, more, more than anyone else. What is the situation on the grand, ground in, in, in Afghanistan at the moment? Well, uh, 20 years of civil war, devastation in Afghanistan. Basically, the government only functioned in the cities. Rural areas were, were more or less controlled by the Taliban. So uh, now you have a situation where after 70 years, Taliban have taken over. Now, I would imagine there is a lot of, when you come into power after 20 years, in our case, we came into power after 22 years, there, you have a lot of problem dealing with people who have given a lot of sacrifices, or different sacrifices for my party, but in their case, with blood. Now, they would want to get placement in the hierarchy of the government. And yet the government is clearly trying to get an international acceptability. So it wants an inclusive government. It talks about human rights and uh, uh, not allowing its soil to be used for terrorism <clears throat> by anyone. And I think <clears throat> this is where the world, it's a critical point for Afghanistan. The world must engage with Afghanistan. Because if it pushes it away, Within the Taliban movement, I would imagine there would be hardliners. And so it can easily go back to the, 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 the Taliban of 2000, uh, 20 years ago. And that would be a disaster. Because 20 years of uh, Amer uh, the NATO presence, $2 trillion down the drain, hundreds and thousands of people dead. And if it reverts back to that sort of crisis, uh, chaos there, fertile ground for terrorists like ISIS, which is actually a, a real worry for all of us, especially for Pakistan. Um, I think that it would be a total waste. I mean, it would be, what has the US got to show after that 20 years? So therefore, a stable Afghan Afghanistan government, which can then take on ISIS, and believe me, uh, Taliban are the best bet to get rid of ISIS, that is the, the only option left. Isolating them, sanctioning them, is going to, apart from anything else, apart from the chaos, it is going to be such a huge humanitarian crisis. Half the population is below the poverty line. The UN thinks that by next year, 95% of the population will go below the poverty line. The government only depended, 75% of the government budget was foreign aid. So if they leave them like this, my worry is it could easily revert back to 1989 when the Soviets left and the US left. And 
over 200,000 Afghans died in that chaos. And, and that's what, where Taliban emerged, in that chaos. So I think it's a critical time, and the US has to sort of really pull itself together because people in the United States are in a state of shock. It seems that they, you know, they, were, they were imagining some sort of a democracy or nation building or liberated women, and suddenly they find Taliban back. And they, 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 I don't think they have sort of found their feet as yet. There's so much anger and shock and surprise. But unless the US takes the lead, we are worried here that chaos in Afghanistan, we are the country which will be affected more after that. What, what did uh, President Biden say when you put these points to him, as I imagine you will have done? No I, no, I haven't spoken to President Biden as yet. You haven't spoken to President Biden? Well, it's, you know, it's up to him. It's a superpower. You're the, ne you're the next door neighbor to, to Afghanistan. They've just spent three, as you, it's, it's in the situation you say, whether, like it or, whether the Americans like it or not, you have an immense influence on the country. And, and President Biden has not spoken to you. I find that absolutely astonishing. Um, we ha I mean, our security chiefs have spoken. Uh, our foreign minister has been in touch with uh, uh, the US uh, foreign secretary. Uh, but no, we haven't spoken, but we are in touch. Uh, all these things we have uh, spoke to the US. That are, are they listening to you? I, I think, uh, you know, at the moment, as I say, just watching the Senate hearing, there's shock in the US. They can't believe what has happened. They can't, you know, they were, because they were obviously misled. They were being told that democracy was coming and women are being liberated and this nation building and so on. They can't believe that Taliban are back in power. And mo most of all, that the billions of dollars spent on the Afghan army gave, 300,000 Afghan army gave up without a fight. Uh, that what's the, uh, what they can't understand because they were never given an accurate picture. I went to the U.S. in 2008, and I spoke to the think tanks. Then there was the Senator Biden and Senator John Kerry and uh, Harry Reid. I spoke to them. I said, "You will. This will. There will be no military solution. You're going to. This is a quagmire. They talked about Iraq at the time. This was a much bigger quagmire. They didn't know the history of Afghanistan." So our army chief two years later went, uh, General Kiani, he said the same thing to President Obama. He said, you're going to leave a big mess. We will have to deal with it. And you will not have a military solution. But unfortunately, you know, I think they were led by the generals. And you know what the generals always say, what they've always said, give us more troops and we'll win, and more time. How do you assess how the Taliban have behaved since gaining power? Uh, I think, David, we, ha we, we have been so relieved because we expected a bloodbath, you know, uh, and always when there's a civil war, a puppet government backed by foreigners like Soviets, like before them the British in the 19th century. Um, when the Soviets left, there was a bloodbath. And we were fearing that um, in Kabul, when the Taliban came and, uh, you know, we thought it, uh, there would be, a, uh, you know, a bloodletting of uh, the sort of what happened in, after 1989. So it was peaceful transfer of power. So that was the best thing that happened. Uh, but also we felt that, you know, we would be uh, blamed for this. But because 300,000 troops surrendered without a fight, Clearly, we didn't tell them to surrender without a fight. So the, so the ground realities were that Taliban had become a popular movement, especially in the rural areas. The, and that's why the, the army gave up without a fight. And secondly, the Ghani government was corrupt to the core. They were, you know, they had no, firstly, they were perceived as a puppet government, then corrupt. People, you know, who was going to fight for them? To, but you, you haven't fully answered David's question now, which is, it hasn't been a, as inclusive a government as we hoped. It hasn't, it's, it's not, you know, women's education remains a huge, a huge problem. I mean, the w future of women's cricket in Afghanistan, that, that lovely success story of Afghan cricket, and yet women's cricket doesn't seem to have a role to it. I mean, these are very serious things, and these are being watched in, in the West, because people are going to, are saying. I mean, it's being weaponized, yeah. if you like. 
but but it's also true, isn't it, that that, that if you are an Afghan woman, your your rights have have gone back ten years, twenty years. Two things separately. Number one, uh, is it an inclusive government? Uh, not right now, but Taliban have so far stated that they are, it's a transitory government and they want to include other people. What they have stated is that they will not include anyone from the former regime of, of Ghani. Uh, and really they need an inclusive government because Afghan, Afghanistan is a diverse society. It has uh, mainly Pashtun 50%, then there's huge Tajik mi uh, minority. And I have tried my best with the Tajik, Tajikistan president somehow to get them together. Then there are Uzbeks there, and Uzbekistan is trying to sort of uh, get them together. So the neighbors are interested that they all form an inclusive government. So it's a stable government. About women's, yeah, you know, <clears throat> please remember, Kabul, the women always had, the culture in Kabul for women was different to the rural areas. In the rural areas, women's lives hasn't changed. This is how they lived, you know, it's a culture. It'll uh, probably take time to evolve. The main issues of, uh, in Kabul itself, and Kabul, if you went there 50 years ago, the Kabul culture was different to the rest. Now, my contention is that rather than forcing Taliban, you know, to do this and include so and so and give the women, they have said that they will give women uh, a, a education. They have said that they will allow them to go to jobs in the Islamic culture. I don't think they should be pushed to, to the point where there is clearly within their, their, their uh, uh, the Taliban sort of, uh, 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 the ground soldiers, you know, who have a certain concept. You don't want to push them to a point because they don't have such clear leadership who can order them. And so they, I would imagine they would have problems from within. So give them time. They have made the right statements. We have no other option. What else are we going to do? If we sanction them, uh, the, you know, there's going to be the biggest humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Chaos there. So uh, the best is to incentivize them to walk the talk, what they're saying, uh, incentivize them. But if you force them, I would imagine the nature of the people is such that they will push back and, and they will, you know, it will be counterproductive. Can I move on to the Pakistan Taliban, the TTP? I mean, I, I, I've, I, on the flight over, I was rereading re your wonderful book you wrote seven or eight years ago, Pakistan, in which um, you made the observation that once the Americans left, that, would, they were ba that was basically the cause of the instability, and then things would settle down naturally. The Americans have left, but have they settled down naturally? Is, it, it, the TTP is, is a problem in Pakistan now, isn't it? It, isn't, it isn't, hasn't been solved by the departure well, of the Americans. Well, well let's, let's put it in perspective. The re, what was TTP? TTP were Pashtuns along on the Pakistan side of the border. You, you know, just for, for the viewers, Taliban is a Pashtun movement. There are about 45 to 50% Pashtuns in Afghanistan. On the Pakistan side of the Duran line, which was made by the British, are twice as many Pashtuns. But what is called the tribal area was the border area uh, on the other side of uh, Afghanistan. There, there were the Pashtun tribes, and there was actually no border. The Duran line was never accepted. They, they used to move back and forth. There was, now we have fenced the border, but there was nothing there. Now, uh, when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, they removed the, the Taliban, the Pashtuns on this side were completely sympathetic with the Pashtuns, not because of the religious ideology, but because of Pashtun ethnicity and nationality, which is very strong. So they turned against Pakistan when we became an ally of the U.S. They called us collaborators. And they then started attacking the Pakistan state and started calling themselves Pakistani Taliban, which we hadn't had before we joined uh, the alliance. So uh, at one point, there were 50 different uh, groups called themselves Taliban attacking us. There were 16,000 
terrorist attacks in, inside Pakistan. 80,000 Pakistanis died. So as the American footprint decreased, so did this movement, the motivation went down because no longer were we collaborators. And now, clearly, we are no longer collaborators because there's, we are not uh, you know, allying ourselves with, any, um, uh, with anyone which is fighting the Pashtuns. So the motivation has gone down. Now we are trying to talk to those who can be reconciled because it's from a position of strength. I always believe you know, all insurgencies eventually end up on the dialogue table. Uh, like the IRA, for instance. So now, from a position of strength, we want to talk to them. Because uh, in Afghanistan, the, the, the Afghan Taliban have assured us they will not allow them to attack us from Afghanistan side, which the previous government did. RAW, which was the Indian agency aligned with the Afghan agent, uh, intelligence agencies, they helped them conduct attacks. One was a very, the biggest attack against the Chinese nationals here. So, so now, because the Afghans won't, uh, Taliban won't allow them, we now have talked to them who we can reconcile and re, uh, give up their, uh, uh, their arms and, uh, and live as normal citizens. So we, that's what we're trying. And the ones who then obviously the government will uh, take action. I thought the TTB had been solved as a problem and it's re-emerged, hasn't it, since the fall of Kabul? No, the, the TTP was always, uh, it had been pushed out of Pakistan uh, we conducted a, you know, a, a huge operation. I've, I, I've, I've been there. I've, I've, I've seen it. I, in I, North Waziristan. I, I gave a, I, and I very much remember presenting a reef to the 5,000 or more martyrs who fought in that terrible conflict. But you're talking to people who have slaughtered tens of thousands of Pakistanis. It must be very, very tough, that. Uh, <clears throat> I remember, uh, Peter, there were about 50 different groups motivations of different groups were different. A lot of these uh, uh, TTP were because of the collateral damage. In the Pashtun culture, in the code of honor, if a family member is killed by someone, they have to take revenge. And to take revenge, they used to join the other side. And there were 480 drone attacks in our tribal areas. Imagine the collateral damage that caused. And secondly, the military operations in a tribal area. Whenever army goes into civilian areas, there's collateral damage. So that, <clears throat> in my opinion, in Afghanistan, the Afghan Taliban, uh, the, uh, one of the Afghan ambassadors told me here, he said most of the Taliban in Afghanistan who became Taliban were because of the collateral damage, night raids, aerial bombardment. Exactly the same situation was there. What is, your, what is your view of the American use of drones now in Afghanistan? I think it is the most insane way of fighting terrorism. How do you, I mean, doing a drone attack in a village, mud huts, and expecting that there won't, there won't be other casualties. And a lot of times the drone attacks targeted the wrong people on wrong As information. We saw immediately after the fall, that terrible event, immediately after the in, uh, liberation you know, or the fall, how you carried it. Well, Peter, problem. one of the reasons which sparked off, there were two attacks which sparked off uh, uh, insurgency, so-called Pakistan Taliban. One was in 2004 where they bombed uh, some people who, th who they thought were militants, but were actually our own tribal people. And the next day they bombed the funeral where there were a lot of people gathering and that's what sparked off anger there. Then they, they, they bombed, uh, uh, killed 80 people and said that they were all terrorists. They announced that they had killed 80 people. Turned out they had bombed a school and 80 children had been killed. So, uh, and then a few days later, one of the parents then did a suicide attack in one of our army academies and killed 50 yeah, recruits. Know, I've, so I've this been, is how- I've been there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is how it just multiplied. So, you know, the more collateral damage, the militants grew. And exactly the same thing happening, night raids, you know, humiliations, going into people's houses, not knowing their, uh, uh, their culture, uh, and, and then aerial bombardment. So, so the Americans say to you, can, can we have a base in, 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 in Pakistan to, to launch attacks on ISIS? What will you say? I think uh, that they don't need a base here because we do not want to be part of a conflict again. Pakistan was the biggest collateral damage of Afghanistan. By joining the US, 
No country paid such a heavy price as us. 80,000 Pakistanis died. Our economy was devastated. $150 billion lost to the economy. It was called the most dangerous place in the world. Cricket teams refused. Investors refused, refused to come. Our currency lost half its value by 2008. So three and a half million people internally displaced. We suffered because of that. And then rather than being appreciation for this, a country which had nothing to do with 9-11, which paid such a heavy price, we were actually scapegoated. Even now in the Senate hearing, they talk about Pakistani safe havens. There were 480 drone attacks. I mean, they see everything. They even spotted vehicles down there. How would they not spot these safe havens? So, you know, I thought we were very unfairly scapegoated for, you know, what was obviously clearly a, a big failure in Afghanistan. What role do you expect China to play in Afghanistan? And, and, and how would you uh, typify uh, Pakistan's relationship with China now? Uh, David, the Pakistan-China relationship is 70 years old. And it is probably one relationship uh, which has stood the test of time. I mean, in all our ups and downs, China stood with us. You know, in all different, uh, when I'm talking about this, these drone attacks and the, and the terrorism in Pakistan because we joined the US, I mean, our economy, our, our debt in 10 years, 2000 to 2018, it went up four times from the, all, the total debt accumulated till 2008. In the next 10 years, it went up 10 times. So. Who was the country that came to help? We were going belly up. It was China who helped us. And so therefore, our relationship in that sense, uh, people remember, uh, you always remember those who helped you in your difficult times. The Uyghurs, I mean, is a, there's no question that you are a great, you are a senior Muslim leader, global, and you have been silent about what, at the very least, is a serious suppression of a, a Muslim minority in a, in a neighboring country. Why is that? You see, uh, Peter, I, I find these selective pronouncements on human rights, I think it is so immoral. Here's now, China is one neighbor, the other neighbor is India. In Kashmir, there are 900,000 troops who've put 8 million Kashmiris in an open prison. They have, over 100,000 Kashmiris have died since 1989. Uh, you know, the way what they are doing in Kashmir right now, and the UN, UN reports saying what they're doing, not one word of criticism in India, not just that, what they're doing to the minorities in India, to the Muslims in India, Muslims in Assam, the laws they have passed, it's a total racist government. Now, what I find so... Now we, we're going to come... We, 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 no. Kashmir is a very serious subject. We really want to come on to that, but... No, but Peter, Peter I'm, I'm, you know, my, I'm following from there. Now, they want us to criticize what's happening to the Uyghurs. We, we have spoken to China. The Chinese have given an explanation what is happening there. Um, and, and our relationship with China is such that we have an understanding that between us, we will talk to each other, but behind closed doors, because that's the nature, the culture. We do not talk about it in public. But in public, all I want to say is that why is there not so much such indignance in, about uh, what is happening in Kashmir by the, the same countries that want us to talk about the Uyghurs? And my second point was also is, uh, Peter, that you know, there's, uh, the whole Muslim world is in turmoil. You go on from Syria to Yemen to everywhere, the Muslims dying. We, as a government, decided that our main focus right now should be a disputed territory between Pakistan and India where all these human rights violations are taking place. Let the world take notice of that first. Then we will talk about other uh, violations of human rights. On Kashmir, um the world seems to uh, re regard Kashmir as a, as, as a Pakistan national interest. And um, you regard this as, a, above all, as a human rights issue. How can you separate uh, the two agendas? 
uh, and, and get the world to focus on what's actually happening in India-controlled uh, Kashmir. Kashmir was a disputed territory between Pakistan and India, and this was confirmed by two United Nations Security Council resolutions, which said that the people of Kashmir will be allowed through a plebiscite uh, under the UN auspices uh, to decide whether they want to be par part of uh, in India or Pakistan. Now, that right was never given to them. <clears throat> but worse, in 2019, 5th August, they had the special status until this right of uh, self-determination was given to them. They took away the special status. And they clamped down on them by sending these uh, 90,000 troops there. And basically, Kashmir is an open prison. Now, our problem is that we are not now talking about it as a territorial issue. We are simply talking that give, allow the Kashmiris, and we in Pakistan have given them the other option. They don't have to come either to Pakistan or India, just their right, democratic right, if they want to be an independent country. So um, this is where it is. India, it, clearly the ball lies in Indian court. What do they do now? Uh, they cannot indefinitely have put these people in an open prison. Uh, because having taken this step, I don't know what they expected. They are now trying to change the demography of Kashmir by settling, bringing settlers from outside, which, which was also in uh, the constitution um, provision st prevented this from happening, that uh, settlers would not be allowed to uh, settle in Kashmir. And then the, uh, the Geneva Convention, it states clearly that you cannot change the demography of, a, of, a, of an occupied country. You know, until that status is clear whether they're part of India, you can't change the demography. So they're actually trying to convert them from Muslim majority to a minority. How dangerous a situation? It's been rather forgotten because so much else has been going on. But how dangerous, ha here we have two nuclear powers um, at odds with each other, and they're fighting almost all the time, isn't there, at a low level. Uh, you know, how dangerous a situation is Kashmir? Peter, if you look at the uh, flashpoints, probably the nuclear flashpoint right now in the world is Pakistan-India, because nowhere else is there such a situation where there are two nuclear-armed countries who've had three wars uh, before they were nuclear-armed, nuclear, nuclear armed. so we haven't had a war since then so because of the deterrent. Uh, I think as a 13-year-old, you wanted to join up, didn't you, in 19... <laughs> I still remember. 65, yeah. I still remember yeah. that. But I feel that, you know, we had this little skirmish um, when uh, there was a suicide bomb which went off in Kashmir. Indian soldiers were killed and they blamed us. We kept saying that we will give us any evidence and we will, uh, we will hold those uh, responsible. We will take them, uh, but have them punish us even give them to India, rather than giving us uh, evidence, they bombed us. Fortunately, there was no loss of life, so you know, Pakistan also uh, retaliated, uh, again bombed somewhere, but they, and then they shot down an Indian plane. Uh, so in that situation, I mean, I as a chief executive felt it could have gone anywhere. We immediately returned the pilot, you know, was shot down to, to cool down things because once two nuclear-armed countries get into the situation, like we did, uh, it, it can go anywhere. So I think I actually addressed the United Nations too and, uh, and told them that, look, you came into being to stop this sort of thing. There's an unresolved issue. It's your own Security Council resolution. In East Timor, the people were given the right. They passed a resolution. They were given a right to decide the destiny, plebiscite, they became independent. Why not Kashmir? And unfortunately, it's because of once, uh, you know, if you're big enough, you have a huge market uh, for uh, uh, goods, uh, that gives you the leverage actually to get away with, uh, you know, which, which East Timor could not get away with. All this seems incredibly familiar to Palestinians. 
uh, what's happening to, to, to Indian-controlled Kashmir. How dangerous is the liaison between Israel and India right now? I, I feel that, uh, well, they are very close, uh, you know. Uh, I mean, should we read it, anything into it that uh, Narendra Modi visits, visits Israel and then he comes back and clamps down on Kashmir and, you know, the events of uh, 5th August 2019? Because that's what Israel has done. They have just built such a strong security apparatus and they just crush any, anything. They will send people in, they will kill, assassinate, um, and then they have total uh, immunity. They, you know, whatever the United Nations General Assembly says, they have uh, complete confidence in the veto of power which the US has in, in the Security Council. So they get away with anything. And I feel that India feels, because now it is uh, being used, or it is considered uh, a bulwark against uh, China, they are now part of the Quad, I feel it's the same thing, India can get away with anything. My, my whole point is that when they ask us to comment on human rights elsewhere, the worst human rights violation is in Kashmir. Nowhere, nowhere, uh, maybe in Israel, but nowhere are things as bad as they are in Kashmir. Were you pressurized by any Gulf country to recognize Israel? No, we weren't. No one pressurized us. And in any case, I mean, Pakistan is a democratic country. I mean, there's no way we can take a decision without carrying our people with us. So there was no, uh, at no point where did someone whisper in your ear and say, why don't you join? This is the incentive for joining the Abraham Accords. No one, no one did. I wonder if I could um, change the subject and quote uh, what I, th I think are very prescient words from your book about Islamophobia in Europe. Um, the ascent of right-wing anti-immigration parties in Europe, the misleading and sometimes downright sensationalist reporting against Muslims in the right-wing Western media, France's ban on the burqa, and so on. Nothing's got any better, have it, as it has it over the last seven years since you wrote those words. Peter, look, the problem is, uh, and I blame, blame the Muslim leadership for this too. So, so first, why did the Muslim leadership allow terrorism and Islam to be uh, 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 connected. What has Islam got to do with terrorism? Uh, j just now, this uh, uh, Indian variant of uh, this uh, COVID-19 came across, devastating the world. But the Indians said, look, don't call it Indian variant, call it Delta variant. Well, quite right, because why should sort of any virus be associated with any nation? Similarly, why should terrorism be associated with any religion? No religion, no religion would promote terrorism. I mean, so after 9-11, connecting Islam and terrorism, and then saying radical Islam, you know, as if there's some radical Islam which promotes terrorism. There is only one Islam, and that is of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, in Muslim communities, like every human community, they are moderates, they're radicals, they're liberals. I mean, and the, if I first went to Britain, when I first went there, there were these called, guys called skinheads. They would beat up people who was a packy. They would beat them up. Imagine if I looked upon the British societies through, the, through what the skinheads were doing. You can't define a religion or a human community by just concentrating on their extremes. So these people are like, we have, a, our, ma our fanatics, like the gunman who walks into a New Zealand walks and shoots down 50 worshippers. So when you say radical Islam, so for the man in the street in the West, how is he going to distinguish between a moderate Muslim or radical Muslim? How does he distinguish? So all Muslims become tar a target. And this is why I, this is what Islamophobia is. After 9-11, any incident happened, because I would spend more time in Britain because my children were young there, so I would go and see them. And it was like the whole, people would pray when some uh, terrorist attack took place. 
Immediately the Muslims would pray, I hope it's not a Muslim. Because everyone got branded. After 9-11, I never forget, this journalist called me up and he said, aren't you ashamed of being a Muslim? You know, 1.3 billion people responsible for 19 fanatics or terrorists. That, I, I think I'm right in saying that was Martin Bashir who rang you up. Yes, uh, you know, not, not the best of the journalists, but he called me up. I was so shocked by it. So this is the problem, what has happened. What is Islamophobia? People do not realize radical Islam, moderate Islam. I mean, in the Western, how does a man in the street? So all Muslims then, and especially anyone who has a sort of symbol of Muslimness, like wearing a, a, a head cover or a beard, although by the way, beards have become quite fashionable now. I hear everyone trendy with a beard now. But so they became targets and they got insulted. I, I'm not talking about people who got beaten up or, you know, uh, killed. I'm talking about normal people being abused in the streets in the Western countries just because they look Muslim. So I think it was very unfair. We Muslim leaders should have talked about it, de-linked Islam and terrorism. And secondly, there's this other thing which started with Salman Rushdie. Uh, people in the West do not uh, treat religion like we do. They cannot understand the love, respect, reverence we have for our Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. You know, people love him more than anything. Respect and love for him is paramount in our religion. Uh, I know how, you know, you know religion is uh, treated in, in the Western countries. When I went, there was this Monty Python's flying circus about Jesus Christ, life of Brian, and I was so shocked. I had never seen anything like that. But pe people in the West would say that is, a, that is a difference between the Muslim world, I've heard them say, and, and the West, i.e. the West supports free speech and Muslims don't. And that, but, 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 yeah. but Peter, that's what I'm trying to say. So I know the difference. I know how the West treats religion. But I also know how they live their religion and the place of the Holy Prophet. You know, they, they can't understand it because of their view. So it was up to us to make them understand. That look, don't, you can write, there's so many interpretations of the life of the prophet, Western interpretation, no one comments on it, but don't ridiculize him, don't mock him, don't insult him, which is what Salman Rushdie did, and the West didn't realize. But what he said was the most insulting thing for Muslims. It was the most, you know, it is the most degrading thing to the things he said about a prophet. Therefore, it was a question of we Muslim leaders should have explained to the West that look, you know, just like, and I, I quote this, Holocaust, it caused a lot of pain to the Jewish community. So, you know, even interpretations which do not, you know, which are not misinterpretation of Holocaust, I mean, there are countries in Europe where there's a jail sentence for that because it causes pain to them. All I wanted them to understand is no, no one should be allowed to cause pain to human communities if we have to live in a, in a sort of global village. Therefore, we Muslims must make a, every human community must define what gives them pain. This is what gives us pain. So all you have to do is not mock and ridicule and uh, insult it, our prophet, but you know, their interpretations, you can write history. I read his historical, uh, uh, books all the time by the Western writers about Holy Prophet and their interpretation, which we don't agree with, but no one objects to it. But it's not just skinheads beating up Muslims, uh, in, in, in your phrase. It is uh, the Emmanuel Macron using Islamophobia to outflank the uh, extreme right in France. That's, 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 that's a a big step up from, from, from what's happened before. You see, I, f I feel that President Macron doesn't really understand, you know, how is he going to do, deal with the Muslim community there. Unless he understands that, there will be this vicious cycle. There will be someone who will, again, as I said, insult our prophet. Among the fringes, there will be a, 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 an over-the-top extreme reaction, even stabbing or something. That then will raise outrage in the French society saying, look at these people, they don't understand our 
our freedom of expression is like a religion. They will react like that. Police will clamp down on mosques and something. They will then marginalize the Muslims more. From that marginalized community will again someone do it. So they are caught in the cycle. And to get out of it, all they have to do is, there must be an understanding that, look, we, if either you decide to expel all the Muslims from there like Spain did in 1492, or you, uh, there must be some code of existence together. In Pakistan, we have this blasphemy law. The blasphemy law was made by the British when they were uh, ruling India. What was the blasphemy law? That if there are three different human communities living in a village, Previously, what would happen is that someone would insult a sacred entity of the other community. There would be a riot. People would be, would be killed. So they then said, look, this is not allowed. So instead of there being a riot, they would go to the police saying that, look, he's insulted my, and accordingly they'd act. So it was a deterrent not to insult other people. There has to be some sort of an equilibrium in the French society. Otherwise, my worry is that the cycle will keep going on and on. Climate change. We've got the big conference, I think it's next month. Will you be going? <coughs> I'm planning to go. And what will be your, your message uh, at this? I mean, it, many people say this is the, one, the last chance to save the world from some cataclys cataclysmic disaster. Do you agree with that? Uh, Peter, some of us, you know, who, who've lived by nature, because I grew up, you know, really where I lived was like a village, you know, outdoors. It's now, it's now almost central Lahore, isn't it? It is now. Zaman Park. It, it yes. is. You can't sit outside. <laughs> it. It's like on the edge of a motorway. Uh, and then all my hobbies were, you know, I would love trekking. Pakistan has the most beautiful trekking in the world. And then I, I, I love this. In the winter, I love portrait shooting, which was a beautiful time here. In the, and so my whole my life was outdoor. And then cricket outdoors on, you know, beautiful grounds. People like us saw this change coming. You could see the, gradually the temperature getting warmer. And people in the villages, people who live by nature, also sense this. Maybe 20 years ago, you saw this happening. But the world, I think, in the last two years have suddenly discovered these strange weather patterns. And countries affected, like I'm in Germany, look at what happened in Germany and so on. So, and the fires that are in California, Siberia, um, in Mediterranean countries. So, people have begun to realize that we are really now, the human survival instinct has, I feel, kicked in. They are realizing that if you keep going at this rate, this, uh, things are just going to keep getting worse. And therefore, the emergency. My only worry is that the main uh, the people who, uh, the countries that are responsible for these carbon emissions are the developed industrial con indus industrialized countries. They are the ones who are really responsible for the, uh, the, the high percentage of emissions. But I feel that they are making the right noises, but they are not willing to take the hard decisions because it is, it is going to be difficult, you know, when you change uh, to renewables, it's going to be difficult and painful. Already they are talking in Europe about, you know, the gas prices going up and so on. So I think that unless and until they walk the talk, what they are saying, they then, you know, do it. They put their money where the mouth is. It's not going to happen because <clears throat> when, <clears throat> when you worry about your elections, you worry about unemployment uh, and, and with with, with Donald Trump, he was quite forthright. He, he didn't even, he didn't even uh, hide behind any euphemisms. He pointly, for him, progress, growth rate, jobs were more important than climate. Now, unless climate becomes more important than this, I'm afraid this, this, we will have a lot of conferences, but uh, you know, for, for electoral purposes, people will make the right noises. What, what do you want COP26, I think it's COP26 to do? I, well, for a start, look, it, it has a financial cost. If you want to really make an impact, you have to spend money on that. So clearly countries like us, we are doing way, we're punching above our weight. We're planting 10 billion trees in this country. 10 billion. 10 billion. We started 1 billion. 
We achieved that. We planted two, two and a half billion right now. We are on our way to 10 billion. And then we are cutting down, you know, we had coal, coal power plant uh, uh, in the schedule. We scrapped that. And there's one going which if we get some funding, we're willing to change that to, uh, you know, to renewables. Uh, uh, and then we're trying to preserve, uh, you know, uh, we're making different ways of preserving, uh, you know, our water supplies and increasing um, our oxygen, cleaning our rivers. <clears throat> but whatever we do, unless the richer industrialist countries, unless they take steps, I'm afraid, uh, you know, we don't, our, our contribution to emissions are negligible, about less than 1%. Finally, um, apparently you, you used to be a cricketer. Um, England, the ECB cancelled um, a five-day tour of Pakistan um, against the advice of the British High Commission, apparently. What was your reaction given that all that Pakistan had done for English cricket in the last two years of those two tours, they come to the rescue during COVID, and then the English cricket board just cancels with no real... Uh, what, what did you make of that? What, what message did that send? Well, you know, I've seen the evolution of Pakistan, England, cricket ties over the years and, and with the other countries. I think that there is this... Uh, still this feeling in England that they do a great favor to play for countries like Pakistan. Uh, one of the reasons is that obviously the money, money is a big player now for the players as well as for the cricket boards. Indian cricket board now is the richest cricket board in the world. The money lies in India. So India basically now controls world cricket. I mean, they do whatever they say go. No one would dare do, do that to India because they know that the sums involved, India can sort of produce much more money. So therefore, I've, I felt that it was, I think England let itself down. I didn't criticize, I didn't say anything. But I think England let themselves down because I expected a bit more from England. I did not expect them, you know, just uh, unilaterally without even consulting anyone. And of course, the biggest worry of protection of the foreign teams is for us. Imagine if something happens and Pakistan to a team, we are responsible. And we have one of the best intelligence agencies in the world. So I checked thoroughly. We, we had completely secured everything. I mean, in the, even the New Zealanders, they got scared and they left. But you know, uh, in the end, I didn't really uh, comment on it. I think the teams let themselves down. And let Pakistan down too, because it's very important, isn't it, that after the terrible events a decade ago with the Sri Lankan team that you, you've had this long period of coming back to world cricket and then suddenly at the very last minute for England to turn their back on you. It was a kick in the teeth, wasn't it? It was, it was disappointing, but I think uh, if you, England should analyse what they've done, the England team, they should ask themselves the question. What would, what would they think if some country did that to them? That when they were finally, and they had gone to that country in difficult times when no other team would tour. And, and Pakistan went to England at that time when there were COVID restrictions. And then, you know, how, how would they have felt if it had happened to them? Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.